This is Six Nativity Stories. This is Lecture 2, or Part 2, the New Testament Apocryphal Gospels. As I just noted, Luke and Matthew provide the only biblical accounts of Jesus' birth, and only two narratives are in these Gospels from his childhood. These are his exile in Egypt as a toddler, and his visit to the Jerusalem temple at age 12. The Gospels of Mark and John introduce Jesus as an adult, leaving out any mention of Jesus' birth or early years. Yet, there remain several other written sources about the Nativity and the early years of Jesus' life. These written sources are very old and very interesting, but most Christians are not aware of them. These additional stories are written in the books known collectively as the Apocryphal Gospels. And this word Apocrypha is, again, from Greek. Most of these Christian words come from Greek. Um, Apocrypha means something hidden. And these were the hidden books. These were the books that weren't in the Bible, but they were hidden. Literally hidden away in some places in jars um, as they were found in, um, in Egypt, in the ground. And um, they were not considered to be public books after the canon, which I will describe in a moment, after the uh, canon was established. So they're outside the canon. So these are books that are about Jesus or about the apostles or about the teachings of Jesus. And they're very old books, but they're not as old as the Gospels and they're not as authentic as the Gospels and epistles that we have in our New Testament. Let me go on. So apocrypho, apocrypha comes from the Greek word apocryphos, meaning something hidden. And uh, the apocryphal books of the New Testament are not just Gospels, there are epistles, some poetry, and other books of Revelation, other apocalypses as well. The one thing all these books have in common was they were each rejected. They were each rejected by the bishops and scholars of the United Orthodox Catholic Church in different church councils, meeting in different years in different cities. This all happened in before the 390s in AD, before the year 400 AD. And I want to make a comment, this, uh, this United Orthodox Catholic Church, this is the Christian Church before it split. In the year 1054 there was a split, there were Orthodox here in the East and Catholics in the West. We're talking about the years before they split, when the Church was unified as one Church, and that Church covered Europe, and even um, Eastern Europe and Russia and the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, this is very important when I say Orthodox Catholic, I mean the United Church when it was one before that split. All right? um, by the decade of the 390s, like I said, the Church had finalized a collection of books in these Church councils in the New Testament to 27. The amazing thing about these councils that were happening from the 370s to the 390s in various cities with various bishops and various times, um, the amazing thing about these councils is they all agreed on including the same number of books in the Christian scriptures. And we have these same 27 books in our New Testament to this day. And every Christian church around the world today has the same New Testament. No matter what other changes have happened to the churches, it split Catholic and Orthodox once, and then the Catholic Church split Catholic and Protestant. Then the Protestant Church is split. Churches splitting throughout history. But it's the same 27-book New Testament. And all these different believers that believe very different attitudes toward Christianity, or very different attitudes toward the Gospel even, they still have the same 27 books in the New Testament. That is an amazing miracle of history that we have so many different churches, all with the same New Testament. And it's been that way since the year 400, with some exceptions, which I will get into now. Um, all right, I'm talking about the Apocryphal Gospels now. The mainstream church rejected the additional Apocryphal books. Why? Because they were written centuries after the original Gospels and Epistles, number one. Because their authorship was mostly unknown. These were anonymous books without any trace to St. Luke or St. Paul, for example. That's number two. And because they portrayed Jesus' life and teachings in a way that was not consistent with the image of Christ in the four Gospels and the doctrines of the Church from the Epistles. Reason three. Reason four, these books were rejected. They had All the books that were rejected had no history of acceptance by any Catholic Orthodox churches in any cities of the Roman or Byzantine Empire, North Africa, wherever. They were only accepted by churches outside the Catholic Orthodox, Orthodox Catholic faith. 
Historically, there were other sects of Christians who were not part of the mainstream church. And some of these groups used these alternative gospels and epistles in their uh, services and uh, for their doctrines. The most well-known of these groups are collectively known as Gnostics. Here's the Everything Gnostic Gospels group, which I'll explain in a minute. What are Gnostics exactly? Hmm. And why don't you pronounce the G? It's just Gnostic like that. Um, the Gnostics taught that Jesus meant, that is, Jesus <laughs> they taught that Jesus meant his followers to have special knowledge, special secret knowledge outside the mainstream gospel that Jesus saves you from your sins and you must believe and have faith in the Holy Spirit to, um, to give you faith in Jesus. That's a very simplified gospel. The Gnostics took Christianity and they made it complicated in the early years. They made it complex. Um, they taught that Jesus meant his followers to have both faith and gnosis with a G. Gnosis means secret mystic knowledge of the teachings of Jesus. There was no united Gnostic church, as there was a united Catholic Orthodox church, there was no united Gnostic church. And the Gnostic sects, they disagreed with each other, as well as with the mainstream church. It is interesting to note that all the Gnostic churches died out by the early Middle Ages. So by the time of the rise of Islam, in the 600s AD, we don't have any Gnostics anymore. And the Gnostic Gospels were buried. After 400, when the church agreed on a 27-book New Testament, they buried these books. And some of these books are going to be the ones with the nativity stories in them. And these are the jars, the story goes they were buried in jars in Egypt in several places for the centuries, and then thousands of thousand years or more went by. And they were finally discovered in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century. Some of these books. Uh, others they had all along. Later, church, later uh, Christian uh, churches never took any of the Gnostic teachings seriously. The Gnostic scriptures are now considered only historical curiosities. No one bases any doctrine or dogma on Gnostic scriptures anymore. They just sell books because they're interesting. Because people that are really know the Bible want to know a little bit more. They may read about the Gospel of Thomas, which is the most, uh, most well-known of these Gnostic books. And there are several books available now about the uh, Gnostic Gospel of Thomas that weren't available like 20 years ago. At least one of these apocryphal Gospels was also used as scripture by the Nestorians. These are Christians who practiced a very different type of Christianity than the mainstream Orthodox Catholics. Nestorianism was considered a heresy by the mainstream church. And this type of Christianity thrived in the eastern empires of Persia and eastern Asia before the time of Islam. Nestorian Christians were not considered to be true believers by the Western churches, that's the Catholic Orthodox faith, and their faith eventually was absorbed by conversions mostly to Islam in the Middle Ages. Uh, so these Nestorian churches that were in Persia and in the East, they became Muslims very slowly, very gradually. By the early Middle Ages, I'd say by the year 1500, there were very few of them left. I have no, noted only one of them. Uh, that survived the year 1600, and no Nestorian churches have survived into recent centuries. And these um, Nestorians and the Gnostics were not mainstream Christians. These were Christians that used different scriptures in their worship. These other nativity gospels are known as the narrative apocryphal gospels, and they tell stories about Jesus' life that both parallel and deviate from the biblical gospels. The other genre of apocryphal gospels was known as the Gnostic gospels, and these are basically just collections of sayings and teachings attributed to Jesus, which had a mystical significant to the significance to the Gnostic sects that I mentioned. The apocryphal nativity gospels, of which I am aware, are the following: the Gospel of Mary, which tells almost the same story as the Gospel of Luke. Um, the Proto-Evangelon of Saint James, or Proto-Evangelon, depending how you pronounce it the Anonymous First Infancy Gospel, and the Anonymous Latin Infancy Gospel. So we have proto Vangelon, Gospel of Mary, First Infancy, and Latin Infancy. That's four. The ones in the Bible are two, and there's one more. That's actually seven. There are six because Mary and Luke tell the same story. The only non-Christian nativity source is actually found in the Surah Mariam. Surah means chapter in Arabic. And it's found in the Surah named Mariam in the Muslim holy book, the Quran. In this surah, Jesus is presented as a prophet of Islam, not the Son of God, as he is defined clearly in Luke chapter 1. 
Since these apocryphal gospels are considered obscure and their information is doubtful by every last Christian denomination, the books of the New Testament Apocrypha are not in any standardly accepted collection. Each publisher has a different listing of what books are considered worthy of publishing, and those are two of them. This is a slightly more modern version by the scholar Bart Ehrman. He translates some of these, and this is uh, an old-fashioned English translation of the Nativity Narrative Gospels are found in this book here. <clears throat> And the text of certain of these Gospels is also available only in an older style of English that I just said. Since there is not enough demand today for copies of forgotten books in modern English, that's forgotten books. You may find them in modern English on the internet, but uh, in published form, um, very rarely will they appear in modern English, and um, they're very hard to find. Yet these lost books paint a more vivid, imaginative, and wondrous nativity story than the two subchapters we have in the New Testament Gospels of Luke and Matthew. The stories as written in the Bible leave out other details found in the non the stories as written in the Bible no, the stories not written in the Bible, I'm sorry. The stories not written in the Bible leave out other details found in the non biblical gospels, details which may or may not be historically accurate. One's personal beliefs about Jesus and the details concerning the life of Jesus are, of course, based on one's personal faith, and I'm not going to comment further on that. I will discuss each of these six nativity stories in detail to give a more complete, thorough, and perhaps fanciful narrative of the nativity of Jesus Christ. I will discuss what is written in these sources compared to what we now know from other ancient histories, archaeology, and church traditions. The main source for my historical analysis has already been done by this historian, Paul Meyer, in this book called The Fullness of Time, and it's published by Craigle Publications in 1991. So we'll be using this as a source. Am I off? <laughs>